the Morrison government's new media bargaining code has just become law. The bargaining code, which will force tech companies such as Facebook and Google and case journalism. Facebook blocked access to news for all Australian users. The whole point of the code is to even up the bargaining power and balance. And the world is watching what happens here in Australia. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. Here are the media stories we're examining this week. Enter the search terms Australia and news, and the results will tell you that Google and Facebook are the story. Al Jazeera launches a new platform aimed at a new audience. The clue is in the name. Muammar Gaddafi's threatening theater of the absurd. We take a look back at the Zenga Zenga speech. And let's learn about national security. Cartoon propaganda for school children in Hong Kong. There are lessons to be learned about the new national security law. We begin with a potentially seismic shift in the news media landscape relating to big tech, our information ecosystem, and who should pay for the news that we rely on. This past week, the government in Australia passed a law called the News Media Bargaining Code designed to force Facebook and Google to pay up for the news content that ends up on their platforms. The two tech giants have long resisted this idea. And while Google backtracked on its threat to suspend its services down under, Facebook did not. Instead, it pulled the plug. And for days, Australians were unable to see local news content on their Facebook feeds. That forced Australia's government back to the bargaining table, a sign of the leverage that these companies have. This story is about more than a clash between governments and mega corporations. It's about value, how much news is worth, who should be funding it, and how. Our starting point this week is the Australian capital, Canberra. Australia's new law, the one written to reconfigure the relationship between big tech and traditional news outlets by forcing tech giants to pay for content, is called the News Media Bargaining Code. It takes direct aim at behemoths like Google and Facebook, sites that utterly dominate the distribution of news online. Even before it passed in Parliament, the law stirred up a storm and had the lawyers working overtime. Spain has tried this, and in France there's been an ongoing court process to get the tech giants to pay news publishers. The big difference with the Australian Media Bargaining Code is that there's actually a process in place where if the media giants and the big tech companies do not come to an agreement, then there's an arbitration process to force there to be some kind of transaction taking place. And that in particular seems to be a piece that Google and Facebook do not want to participate in. Nobody's really tried to introduce a piece of legislation like this before. It's not necessarily a good piece of legislation, but it's a a signal of intent from a major democracy to come up with some sort of way of solving this problem that we've all been talking about for quite some time, the power of these big technology platforms and how to properly hold them to account. As a first effort, it's flawed, but I think it's important that we're starting to have these conversations and expecting our politicians to come up with successful ways of regulating big tech. Few would have predicted an initiative like the Media Bargaining Code coming out of Australia, which is led by a conservative government, the kind that is usually ideologically opposed to new regulations. One cannot ignore the Murdoch factor and News Corp. Rupert Murdoch's media empire has long been headquartered in New York, but his news outlets remain even more influential in the land of his birth than they are in the US or the UK. Murdoch's Sky News Australia and the country's only national daily, The Australian, helped get Prime Minister Scott Morrison into office. Morrison would like to stay there, which may explain why the law has been passed and why some of the fine print reads the way it does. We have one of the most concentrated media markets in the world. And governments know that if they fall foul of News Corp, they could face very serious political consequences. So I think government is interested in making sure News Corp remain happy. And this is a proposal that they supported and that has proven pivotal in the government seeking to action this first. In one sense, Rupert Murdoch is very important. 
you know, he was one of the first advocates for this kind of reform. You know, in, we're talking mid-2000s, getting people thinking about paying for news content. But it's worth noting that the, the actual idea for this code came from the, the competition regulator. And also there has really been a parliamentary, multi-partisan agreement around this reform. Google and Facebook have taken divergent approaches to the new law that reflect the differences in what the two platforms do. Google, which is far more dependent on news content than Facebook is, started negotiating, quickly reaching agreements with several major Australian companies. Among them, Seven West Media and Nine Entertainment. They will both get tens of millions of dollars a year for the journalism that Google used to get for free. Google also made a deal with Murdoch's News Corp, but those figures have not been made public. News is far less integral to Facebook's business model, so it just pulled all news content from its platform in Australia and then waited for the Morrison government to soften its position. Facebook played hardball, knowing it had most of the cards and millions of Australian users on its side of the bargaining table and it, it used an extremely heavy hand. So lots of things that weren't news content were actually stripped from the platform. Countless businesses, community organisations, even public health services had their content taken down, which is immensely dangerous in the country that is about to roll out a vaccination program. Key public health service providers weren't able to talk about that on one of the major social media platforms. So I think Facebook's behaviour is disgraceful, weaponising its users to advance its bargaining position as against the government. And it appears to have worked. This was a very, very bold bit of grandstanding by Facebook, and it's rightly being called out. Facebook's actions were unnecessary. They were heavy handed and they will damage its reputation. There have been some politicians in Australia that have compared Facebook's behaviour to North Korea. What Google did was pay to make the problem go away. What Facebook did was bring the problem to the world's attention. There are a number of questions about the design of this media bargaining code. It has no requirement that these news companies spend this money on journalism and to news companies that it covers are of a certain size, over $150,000 in revenue. And so this media bargaining code is designed to serve the interests of Rupert Murdoch and other large media giants in Australia. By not requiring that this money is spent on journalism, it can just kind of go into the profits, go back to shareholders, and still allow these companies to continue consolidating the market, ensuring that they have power over the news media in Australia. Besides the new money that Australian media outlets will now have coming in, the Media Bargaining Code also gets them into the business of surveillance capitalism. Google and Facebook know far more about you than the news sites you visit do, your habits, your interests. They use that data to target their ads and make more money. The new law stipulates that the two companies must now share the data they have on you with their new partners, news organizations. So personal information that used to live in Silicon Valley, USA, will now also be in the hands of a newspaper in Melbourne or a Murdoch-owned TV channel based in Sydney. It's essentially creating an alignment between big tech platforms and major media organizations as against users. These tech platforms collect huge amounts of data about all of their users. And what news media organizations saw was that they wanted to get in on that action. And the code permits this to happen. It allows them to access information about people who've clicked on the links that go to the news content. And it allows them then to get in on the business model of surveillance capitalism. There's no voice for the user in this particular model. And I think that's very bad for long-term prospects of privacy reform, for example. Well, we start in Australia, Google and Facebook are concerned Australia has Australia, Facebook. Seldom has Australia had this many eyes on it. Governments and their regulators in the EU and well beyond have been taking notes. Facebook had vergangene Woche Nachrichteninhalte in Australian block. Among the proposals in those countries, new tax levies on digital giants and binding negotiations between them and news outlets ordered by law. Governments have something in common with Google and Facebook. They're all accustomed to writing the rules, the terms and conditions of doing business with them. Big tech is not inclined to give that up. And when Facebook pulled the plug and the government compromised, 
Australia, which was a test case, became yet another case in point. The Australian example um, obviously provides a lesson for all of these other countries who are looking to regulate big tech. Regulatory idealism, for want of a better word, um, often runs up against real politic. The bill itself was quite an elegant piece of legislation. It's fallen down in, in the world of real politic that we've cut corners, we've, we've adjusted things because like it or not, Facebook and Google still have a lot of power. One of the issues that has arisen in recent years is the question of whether these companies are too powerful um, to be effectively regulated by governments around the world. And certainly Australia is you know, not a United States when it comes to the power that it can push against these companies in particular, where they're not even headquartered in Australia. So I think that we're seeing that these big tech giants are ensuring that even if they might have to make some concessions, these things ultimately still work in their interests and, and serve their ends. In terms of how this moves the discussion forward, it's shown that there's a hole in the armour of Facebook and Google and has emboldened politicians around the world to maybe get a piece of the action for themselves. And hopefully this can be the first somewhat inelegant step towards better regulation that comes up with successful ways of holding these companies to account and making sure that the huge amount of value that they derive from society is put back into society in a meaningful way. Our next story relates to Al Jazeera's parent company, the Al Jazeera Media Network, AJMN. This past week, the network launched Rightly, a U.S.-based digital platform aimed at conservative Americans. Meenakshi Ravi has been looking into this. Meena, what do we know about Rightly so far? Rightly describes itself as a digital space for moderate and conservative voices between the extremes. Audiences on the political center right that Rightly says are currently underrepresented in mainstream media. Now, AJMN consists of a number of channels, including this one, Al Jazeera English, Al Jazeera Arabic, AJ Plus, and several other channels and platforms. But none of them have ever made an overt pitch to audiences in a specific political constituency. So Rightly is definitely a first. The platform has only been up and operating for a few days now. What is it producing? The launch was pretty low-key. Most of Rightly's programs have yet to be announced, but we did get a glimpse of a discussion show called Right Now with Stephen Kent. Now, Right Now is a little bit of a pun. It's about where the American right stands at this moment and where it could go. Rightly's editor-in-chief is Scott Norvell, who is part of the team that launched Fox News in the United States. Now, Norvell has said that Rightly wants to more accurately reflect the diversity of center-right politics in America than existing mainstream outlets. One of the reasons we're talking about this is because of the reactions that this announcement has provoked. What can you tell us about those? There have been questions, including within Al Jazeera, about how Rightly will sit amongst all of AJMN's other media outlets. For example, Al Jazeera English, whose editorial mission has been to present a diverse range of views and opinions without partiality. Al Jazeera has targeted U.S. audiences before. The last time was in 2013 through Al Jazeera America. Now, AJAM, as it was known, was on the air for just about three years before it was shut down. Rightly is a much smaller venture, and it targets a specific American audience. Will it fare better than AJAM did? What, if any, impact will it have on the Al Jazeera brand? We'll be keeping an eye on that. Okay, thanks, Mina. A couple of months ago, we produced a special on the 10th anniversary of the outset of the Arab Spring. This week, we're zeroing in on one of the most extraordinary media moments of that time. On the 22nd of February, 2011, with Libya in a state of revolt over his 42 years in power, Muammar Gaddafi decided it was time to take to the airwaves. Gaddafi was crystal clear with his audience on just how far he was willing to go to remain in power. He vowed that his opponents would be hunted down house by house. In Arabic, that's bet bet, room by room, dar dar, alley to alley, zenga zenga. For Libyans all too familiar with political repression, the zenga zenga speech, as it came to be known, was equal parts chilling and bizarre. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now on the speech that signaled the beginning of the end for Muammar Gaddafi. Either this is the first Arab revolution of the 21st century or it will be brutally suppressed. It was a time of 
both promise and fear. The Ben Ali regime in Tunisia had already fallen and Ben Ali had fled. In Egypt, the revolution seemed to have worked with Mubarak stepping down. Three weeks of protests that have brought down a 30-year-old presidency. All eyes were on Libya to find out whether the Libyan revolution would succeed. Another Arab leader is facing the wrath of his people tonight, but Libya's Muammar Gaddafi is fighting back hard. There was no way that the regime could maintain itself in the, in the face of an uprising. And that is when Gaddafi saw the danger of his fall of grace, the fall of power. February 22nd, 2011. In the Libyan capital, Tripoli, Colonel Muammar al-Gaddafi prepares to deliver a speech, one that would make history. Just a week prior, Small protests had erupted in Benghazi, in the east of the country. Within days, state security forces had virtually lost control of the city. And in other towns across Libya, protesters were coming together and rising up. Gaddafi had a reputation for delivering political sermons. They were a regular fixture on Libyan state TV. This time, however, was different. This time, the world was watching. When the speech was aired on the 22nd of February, I was at home in Tripoli and everyone was waiting what Gaddafi would say. Gaddafi's speech was very um, hostile, was filled with violence and was the crux point that led to many Libyans to take to the streets. So he spoke in colloquial Libyan. He was telling them, I'm speaking to you in your own language. I'm gonna come to you, every single home, in every single street, and I'm gonna get my revenge on you. I'm gonna kill you. He thought he could stop it by igniting the fear again. Those words were chosen carefully by the people who wrote his speech. He described the protesters as rats. A word that could trigger uh, some feelings among his supporters so that they can come to his rescue. He was uh, feeling uh, the heat on the streets. Gaddafi had taken power in Libya 42 years earlier, overthrowing the country's king and branding himself a revolutionary leader. He'd risen to prominence speaking of Arab unity and Islamic socialism, but his rule would prove authoritarian and corrupt, with graphic displays of violence and bloodshed, often broadcast on the same state channel that aired his many speeches. Central to Gaddafi's rule was his cult of self, defined by his eccentric brand of showmanship. The Zenga Zenga speech was a textbook example. It was a moment that brought together rhetoric and spectacle, starting with the setting, a military compound in the heart of Tripoli, Bab al Azizia. Bab al Azizia is his uh, sanctuary, it is his like uh, safe haven and a symbol of resistance. The place is so eerie because parts of it have been uh, subject to an airstrike by the US in 1986 and Gaddafi kept it the way it is as a symbol of how he resisted imperialism and colonialism. So for him it was a very important setting because that place 
is filled with symbols. The statue, the, the fist uh, crushing the, the American war plane. Every time they cut to the fist to show that, look, we resisted the Americans, uh, so we can do anything to Libyans. Bab al if you were tra to translate it into English, it means the door to glory. Glory to the Gaddafi regime from, from his perspective as a military stronghold that um, was at the heart of his, his power and his control of the country. But it was also marked the end of the Gaddafi regime. The fight kind of ended there. And so it was the, the door to the glory of the Libyan revolution as well. Gaddafi's speech was followed by action. Libyan protesters came under attack from state forces. Air raids and mercenaries roaming the country left hundreds dead. And yet the pressure on Gaddafi didn't ease. Down, Gaddafi down today. Opposition forces closed in on Tripoli. Well, actually the real Gaddafi is hiding in Charlie Sheen. Beyond Sheen. Libya's borders, the speech went down as a piece of absurd political theatre. A remix of the Zenga Zenga line by an Israeli musician went viral. Late night comedians in the United States discovered Gaddafi and his eccentric nature. Omar Gaddafi! The speech set off geopolitical shockwaves that would ultimately lead to Gaddafi's undoing. Less than a month after he spoke, a UN resolution authorized military intervention in Libya. Forces from NATO and Middle Eastern countries descended with airstrikes, a naval blockade, and the arming of rebel forces. I don't think there was any planning in Washington or in Paris to remove him. I think the plan to remove him after that speech, it set up alarms in Washington and in Paris and Moscow for that matter too. I mean, if, if, if he had shut up, Benghazi would have been decimated by now and Gaddafi would be back in power. But this is, this, is, this is the narcissism, this is the ego. The ego forces you to do things that ultimately are detrimental to you. The Zenga Zenga speech was the first of two iconic media moments that marked the Libyan civil war of 2011. The second took place eight months after Gaddafi gave the speech. They were his final moments. Images of rebel fighters dragging their former dictator through the streets were broadcast around the world. It was a grisly spectacle of a fallen tyrant. And much like the speech, it cast a shadow over the Libya that was to come. What that speech represented, it represented the worst side, the, the dark side of authoritarianism. <laughs> Libyans really did not have a choice. It was not their choice to have a, a very bloody and violent revolution. It put Libyans in, in a situation where there was just no going back. It will go down in history as a very important uh, turning point in the Libyan revolution. It is for that generation to decide what kind of legacy is left behind and whether that speech is going to set the tone for uh, the new Libya. And finally, when education meets the law. In mid-2020, we reported on the political unrest in Hong Kong over a new national security law that had Beijing's fingerprints all over it. The law effectively curtails protest and freedom of speech, but the authorities said it will preserve political stability. Now, fast forward to earlier this month, when Hong Kong's official Education Bureau added a new element to the primary and secondary school curriculum, national security education. It produced the following animated video for young students on that same security law. Why leave the propaganda job to China's state-controlled TV channels? Why wait for the kids to grow up? Get them when they're still young. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Every one of us loves Hong Kong, our home. We all hope that our families and people around us can lead a happy and stable life.
for the sake of Hong Kong's continuous development and long-term prosperity, the national security law has been enacted. The purpose of legislation of the national security law is to prevent, suppress, and punish crimes endangering national security, which are clearly stipulated as secession, subversion, terrorist activities, and collusion with a foreign country or with external elements to endanger national security. Before doing anything, we must think carefully. While enjoying our rights, we are also obliged to abide by the law in accordance with the basic law. Together, let's safeguard Hong Kong, our home. Let's learn about national security. Be a law-abiding and responsible citizen.